Good morning, everybody. It's time to uh, do our hymn sing. Does anybody have one that they would like to sing? If not, I have one to start with and get us warmed up. So let's turn to 268. In Christ there is no east or west. And we will do one, two, and five. One, two, and five. Oh, this is a different tune. <laughs> Let's give it a try. In Christ there. that you know. <laughs> Kurt has one. Eight, six, nine. Eight, six. <clears throat> oh, that's a good one. Let's do, um, let's do one and two, since we had rain and snow in our season now. We'll do one and two.
one they would like to sing. Oh, yes. 772, I love a girl that comes prepared. All right. We have, my hope is built on nothing less. Let's do one and two. of families and one of the families said to me my daughter wants to sing deep and wide so it's not in our hymn book but we're going to sing deep and wide I practiced it with her earlier so do you how many people remember deep and wide from Sunday school days all right so you have to do the motions also right so Claire you want to help me with this it looks like Allison wants to help me Come on, Allison, come on up. Because I can't hold this and sing it and do the motions, too. Oh, no, okay, don't do it. Anybody else want to come up and do? I saw Holly. Holly was doing a good job there, too. Okay, Karen, you want to? Oh, Drew. Okay, Drew. Okay. All right, here we're going to do it then. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> It'll, I'll, you'll have me going all around the sanctuary. All right, here we go. Oh, yay, Marty, you'll help me. All right, go ahead. Okay? Good morning. That was fun. There is a fountain flowing deep and wide. Welcome to worship on this Family Worship Sunday. We love to have all ages stay in worship with us. We have a notebook that looks something like this that can help families understand every part of our worship and why we're so glad to have all ages together the last Sunday of every month.
I don't know if you can smell flowers when you walked in. That's the aroma left over from our amazing gathering yesterday to celebrate the life of Vic Granholm. So that love continues on and gathers us here this morning. And I have a question for you. Is it okay to shout in worship? <laughs> that was really good. Yes, it is okay to shout in worship. It's also fine to be quiet and reverential, but also to shout. And uh, in Psalm 47, it says this at the very beginning. It gives us the reason for why we would shout. Not only shouting, but clapping your hands. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is awesome, a great king over all the earth. When I think about the times that I shout and really shout, it's usually because I'm rooting for an athlete or a team. And I really, really, really shout because I'm so excited when they win. And you think about the victory that God has over all evil, every scary, horrible thing going on in the world, God has victory over that in Jesus Christ, right? Can I hear an amen? amen. Can I hear a shout? Yeah. yeah, baby. Okay, let's stand up and clap our hands and shout to God, yes, and sing. Sing the mighty power of God. seated. Yesterday the deacons had their retreat and got launched into their various ministry positions and this was the scripture that we read together out of 1 John 4 about how God is love. If you look at the masthead on your bulletin, this is the theme in our spiritual goal that we are trying to remember as we move through the first half of this year. The scripture is this, beloved let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. We love because he first loved us, and those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. I'd like to suggest that this scripture lead us into a time of confession where we have failed this last week to love, to love in ways that God will bring to mind for us, not just people in our family or in this church, but around us this last week. So let us in silence confess our sins and our failures in love to God.
And now hear the good news earlier in 1 John 4, chapter 1, verse 9. Not 4, but chapter 1. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you, we are a forgiven people. Are you ready to shout again? Do you want to, I want to hear an amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand and sing. Jesus Christ be with you. We're going to take a moment here and pass the peace of Christ to one another and all the children up to grade five are welcome to stay in worship, but we would like the middle schoolers to go on down to their class. They are going to have a class this morning. So let's pass the peace of Christ. Let's have the children come forward up onto the steps. Come on forward to the steps. because I'm going to be reading something and you'll want to see the pictures that I have in here. Well, there's something that some of you may know about me, but not everybody, but I actually spend a lot of time on boats. 
my, yeah, my husband is a boat captain, and so we do a lot of a lot of stuff for other people on their boats, but we also have our own boats. We spend a lot of time on the water on boats. And last weekend, we were helping somebody bring their boat up from San Diego all the way up to Monterey. And so we were out for probably two days, bringing the boat up the coast. And we were about five miles off the coast. And we were at this one spot where it gets kind of rough, where the land juts out it's called Point Conception. And it gets really windy and bumpy out there. And so as we were going along, we were kind of being tossed from side to side. And some of us got a little bit green. Have you ever heard about that? How, what that's like, getting green, you kind of get a little seasick. Yeah, some of us were kind of thinking, oh man, I wish I would have taken my Dramamine about a couple hours ago. But we got through it. But um, there was actually a lot of work to do. You know, we couldn't just, you know, say, I'm going to go lay down and somebody else can drive the boat. We had, to, we had to keep going. So I was thinking about that story when, when Kurt said what he was going to be preaching on this weekend. So he's going to be talking about when Jesus was on a boat and it got pretty rough. And we're going to read from the Jesus Storybook Bible about, the sto about what happened and what the disciples did. You'll have to find out what they did when they were on the boat. So this is called Captain of the Storm. So I'm going to read this to you. The sun was going down. The air was warm and still. Let's go across the lake, Jesus said to his friends. Jesus had been helping people all day, and now he was tired. So he left the crowds at the shore and set out in a small fishing boat. Jesus climbed into the boat to take a nap. Maybe he was feeling a little green too, you think? Uh, probably not. He's Jesus. As soon as his head touched the pillow, he fell asleep. It was a beautiful evening. A gentle breeze rustled the sails. The friends were chatting happily as they headed out into the middle of the lake, and everything was perfect, just right for a nice, quiet sail. What do you think happened next? Um, it got really rough. You think it got really rough? Well, let's find out. Well, look at the picture. It kind of shows that it kind of got rough, didn't it? They were only about halfway across when, out of nowhere, whirling winds swept across the lake, fierce and strong, like a hurricane. A blinding flash of lightning lit up the sky. Thunder roared right overhead. The storm blew the water into towering waves that hurled the little boat up and up and up and then sent it crashing down, down, down. It's a big wave. Yeah, I, my waves weren't that, quite that big. The fishing boat was blown and buffeted and tossed and turned back and forth and up and down and left and right and round and round. In the middle of the storm, Jesus was sleeping. Now, Jesus' friends had been fishermen all their lives, but in all their years of fishing on this lake, they had never once seen a, seen a storm like this. No matter how hard they struggled with their ropes and sails, they couldn't control their boat. This storm was too big for them. But the storm wasn't too big for Jesus. Help, they screamed. Wake up, quick, Jesus, wake up. Jesus opened his eyes. Rescue us! Save us! They shrieked. Don't you care? Of course Jesus cared, and this was the very reason he had come, to rescue them and to save them. Jesus stood up and spoke to the storm. Hush, he said. That's all he said. The strangest thing happened. Look at this guy hanging on for his life. The wind and the waves recognized Jesus' voice. They had heard it before, of course, because it was the same voice that made them in the very beginning of time. 
They listened to Jesus, and they did what he said. Immediately, the wind stopped, the waves calmed down, the glittering, it glittered innocently in the moonlight and lapped quietly against the side of the boat as if nothing had happened. The little boat bobbed gently up and down. There was a deep stillness in the great quiet all around. Then Jesus turned to his wind-torn friends. Why are you scared? He asked. Did you forget who I am? Did you believe your fears instead of me? Jesus' friends were quiet, as quiet as the wind and the waves, and into their hearts came a different kind of storm. What kind of man is this, they asked themselves anxiously. anxiously. Even the winds and the waves obey him. They didn't understand. They didn't realize yet that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus' friends had been so afraid they had only seen the big waves. They had forgotten that if Jesus was with them, that they had nothing to be afraid of, no matter how small their boat or how big the storm. Wow. That's an exciting story, don't you think? So sometimes we get anxious or scared when things are happening and we don't, aren't in control and we don't quite know what's going on around us. We might feel afraid. We might feel all by ourselves. We might even feel that Jesus doesn't care, right? But it's important to remember that Jesus has the power over all things. And when Jesus is with us, his voice will calm us and calm the things around us. And we can trust Jesus because he loves us, and eventually, things will calm down. So let's pray before we go back to our seats with our packets. Dear Jesus, you are so powerful. Help us to remember that we can trust you with all the storms in our lives. Thank you for loving us so much. Amen. All right, over there are the packets. You can take a packet and go back to your seat. We've been in a worship series for the past few weeks on the Gospel of Mark, and today we'll be looking at the conclusion of Mark chapter 4 and the beginning of Mark chapter 5. If you'd like to, you can follow along in your pew Bibles, or you can also read on the screen in front of you as well. Listen to God's Word. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace. Be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, 
he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there on the hillside a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, Send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had had the legion, and they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. This is the gift of God's word. Join me in a word of prayer. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Over the past few weeks, I, I found some research from a few neuroscientists that were talking about uh, our interaction as humans with technology. And some of the research I saw I thought was very fascinating. And two of the ideas that came up I thought were interesting as it pertains to the text that we have in front of us today. The neuroscientists were talking about that some technology is cooperative with our cognitive functions. And some technology we use actually disengages our cognitive functions in life and, and unlearns things that maybe we already knew or already learned. So examples of this are that for those of us who drive and get from one place to another place using Google Maps or something like that, using Google Maps on our phones actually unlearns our way of navigating in the world because we follow Google everywhere we go, right? Have you had this experience? Um, instead of knowing where streets are or that houses on one side of the street are oddly numbered and the other side of the street are even numbers, we don't even recognize these things anymore. Or that certain interstate numbers like even numbers, those go, do those go east and west? Yes. And odd numbers go north and south. We don't even know these things anymore. We've unlearned all of it as a result of our connection to technology. But there's some things that are cooperative with our cognitive functions, some things that we can internalize when we use technology. And they talked about things like language. So if you use a language app like Duolingo and you learn a brand new language on your phone and, and you learn maybe Spanish or French or some other kind of language and you interact with it, you can take the device away and you've learned a new skill set and you can interact with other humans. It's become internalized to you. I thought this idea of technology that can be cooperative with our cognitive functions was really interesting. It was really interesting. This past week, I had the chance to hear a really great podcast, um, and it, it, the person that was featured on the podcast was an old friend of mine. His name is Jason Leonard. He's the executive director of a college ministry in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he was my college pastor for two years, many, many years ago. 
And it was a delight to hear him speak again and to share his thoughts about Christian ministry, especially in what is happening right now in college ministry settings and what God is doing in the midst of his college ministry setting there. And he was talking a lot about social media and especially what I mentioned about the increased role of technology in our lives. And he was talking about what this is like for college students. And he said one of the things that's really interesting as it pertains to college students and their romantic relationships with one another is the increased use of social media. He said that on college campus, uh, you know, if a student is interested in asking somebody out on a date, they go out on a date, maybe they go to dinner or go to a movie or I don't know, whatever 19-year-olds do today to go on a romantic date. And when they're done with the romantic date, they go back to their dorm room and the first thing they do is they go look at social media. They try to find out on social media if it's on Snapchat or Instagram or maybe some kind of group chat that they're a part of or even they might open up their text messaging app and hope to see the dot, dot, dot typing information to you. And in that space, they're doing this because what they want to know is, did that person enjoy that experience with me? They're hoping to see on one of those social media platforms, maybe in some kind of cryptic language, had a good time tonight. Had a good time tonight. It's kind of like a wink, wink, you know, ask me out again. And my, and, my, and my friend Jason said, it's actually really kind of a challenge because what I try to instruct in these young people as they're going through their romantic relationships and their relationship with Jesus is that we want to rush into feeling loved, feeling known by someone else. He said, we prefer intimacy without vulnerability. We prefer intimacy without vulnerability, all of us. And social media has done something so that we can rush to that information right away. Experience intimacy without vulnerability. So that just hours after that date, they could go, oh, they like me, I'm gonna ask them out again. And my friend Jason said, I try to encourage young people to not do that. But instead to allow Jesus to enter into their life in that time as they do a discernment process on whether or not they want to ask this person out on another date, to address their own anxieties that they have inside of themselves about whether or not they want to ask this person out on another date, to just take some time, a day or two days, and then reach out, and then look at your text message and send a message and say, hey, what are you doing this next Friday night? I thought that was really fascinating that this was Jason's encouragement to young people as they go through their dating relationships, to, to let Jesus come in in that day or two to address the anxiety within themselves that they may have. Do I feel loved? Do I feel lovable? Could this person be a good person for me? What I think is fascinating about this is that idea from the technology piece, that Jesus cooperates with our cognitive function. Jesus cooperates with our cognitive function when he addresses our anxiety, when he addresses the, perhaps even the evil within us. You heard in these stories, as Kristen told so wonderfully to the children, uh, that the disciples go to the other side of the lake of Galilee, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They leave the crowds behind. Jesus has done this kind of incredible ministry so far in Galilee. Crowds are gathered around him. He's doing all these amazing things, and they leave that behind for a period of time to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And while they're on the boat, and this great windstorm arises, uh, the disciples are terrified. They have this horrendously anxious moment that's taking place in front of them. And it struck me again as I read that text to you all this morning. They look at Jesus, and they ask him this question. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They are deeply anxious. They're worried about their own safety and their own livelihood, and they ask him this question. And obviously, Jesus cares about their life and cares that they are perishing in this moment, so much so that he commands the winds to stop and the seas get calm, and he just says, peace, be still. He says, do you not have faith? Do you not have trust in me after all the things you've seen take place? Certainly after that situation, perhaps they do have more trust. They do have more faith. And then they find themselves on the other side of the Sea of Galilee in the land of the Gerasenes. 
And one of the most fascinating stories in all of Mark's gospel that you heard t- takes place. It's a terrifying scene, is it not? It's, so, it's a terrifying scene. So many of the gospel stories maybe lack detail, but not this story. This story is filled with detail about this person who finds Jesus, who has unclean spirits inside of them, and the person with unclean spirits was howling, was yelling, lived next to the tombs, was shackled and chained up, was cutting themselves, but was so powerful and strong that the shackles and the chains couldn't bind them anymore, and this person rushes in to see Jesus as soon as they get off the boat. I mean, this is a terrifying image that Mark has portrayed for us about this encounter between these two people. And as they engage in dialogue and in conversation, the first thing that Jesus says to this person is, what is your name? What is your name? I love this question because I feel like it is so disarming to this very intense and anxious producing moment in the midst of what's happening between Jesus and this person coming in front of them. What is your name? It slows the whole narrative down, and in doing so, Jesus addresses the evil spirits within this person to discern who they are. And that person knows who Jesus is and simply asks that they would have permission to leave that human and go into the pigs. They do this, and the pigs go into the sea and they drown and they die. And then there's this beautiful vision of, I think a beautiful vision of what happens after Jesus addresses these evil spirits, sends them out of this person. People hear about it and they come back and they see Jesus sitting there with the demoniac. But the demoniac is clothed and is in his right mind. Did you hear that in the text? There was a movement from a person who was terrifying, who was obviously bruised and chained up and didn't have clothes on, and now here's a person in their right mind and clothed and sitting with Jesus. Jesus, through this simple question of what is your name, addresses the anxiety, addresses the evil spirits within this person, and in doing so, gives permission to let them leave that people, to leave that people, And Jesus empowers that person in that moment to a deeper place of faith, trust, and healing. This is a beautiful story. It's a powerful story. It's an amazing story in the Gospel of Mark. When I think back to the lives of these college students, I think that's what my friend Jason was trying to recommend to them. What is the anxiety you're carrying that makes you want to rush into feeling accepted or feeling loved? What's the anxiety within you right now in this moment? And allow Jesus to speak into that. And when you allow Jesus to speak into that anxiety, it's not like an enabling speaking in, but it's gonna empower you to feel strong and courageous and a deeper sense of faith and trust as you navigate this world as a college student and trying to seek out romantic relationships. You'll find yourself more courageous and more strong with a stronger faith, a stronger faith. Yesterday, we had this beautiful memorial service for Vic Granholm yesterday. Um, The longer I stay here as one of your pastors, the more memorial services I go to, and I'm just struck by the beauty and, frankly, the testimonies I hear about how God is at work in people's lives. It's such a rich experience, and, and I have been grieving this week as we lost one of our own in our own community. And I just so appreciated that we got the chance to gather together yesterday to worship and to pray together and to hear these testimonies. And one of the things I was really struck by was Bob's testimony, Vic's son, yesterday. Thank you, Bob, for sharing yesterday. I didn't know much of Vic's journey of faith, but the way Bob told about it and the way Mary told about it was so rich and beautiful. Um, Vic didn't grow up in a Christian home or participate in uh, a church life until Bob had created his own faith formation and his own journey of faith and got involved in a Christian community. And Vic flew out to go see what Bob was doing, um, probably with a sense of suspicion. (laughs) Maybe he had some anxiety. What is Bob doing? (laughs) What is Bob doing? And, And Vic in the midst of his suspicion and anxiety about what Bob was doing, 
found that there was a great community of people, actually, that surrounded Bob. They had a high quality of character, and it spoke to their relationship with God. And Vic was opened up to perhaps a new way of life, a new way of relationship with God. And when he got back on the airplane to fly home to California to San Carlos, he sat next to a pastor, to a minister on the airplane, and he opened up about his own anxiety. He opened up to that pastor about his journey of life, which was that he lost his own biological father at the age of three, and that he had a deep need for being loved and accepted in his life from a father figure. And the pastor handed him a book of Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, and he heard for the very first time in his life that there was a heavenly father who loved him. Oh, I thought this was such a beautiful story. I, it just made me both filled with love and lament that we lost a beautiful one in our community. God was powerfully at work in his life. And when I think about these stories from the sea and from the garrison demoniac, he had, he had an anxiety. And yet Jesus entered in and asked, what is your name? What is the name of this anxiety? I want to be strong and faithful for you in this place, whatever it is that's going on in your life, and I'm going to be with you. I heard Jesus saying that in that story yesterday. Thank you for sharing the stories. It was beautiful. In the story about the Gerasene demoniac, one of the things that's, that's in the story itself is a multinational and a multiracial reality. Jesus is doing ministry in Galilee for the first four chapters of Mark. Galilee, for the most part, is a Jewish community of people, for the most part. Yes, the Romans came and they occupied that space, so there's a sense in which there's some multinational realities happening. But when he travels across the Sea of Galilee into the new land of the Gerasenes, it's a much more multinational, multiracial environment that's happening in that place. It's less Jewish, it's more Gentile. There are Romans who are present there. When Jesus asks, what is your name, to the evil spirits within the Gerasian demoniac, the demoniac says, my name is Legion. And the sentence that follows after that says, which means many. Legion was a Latin word that was used to describe a garrison of Roman military people. Usually about 5,000 troops were part of a legion in the Roman military. And so it's not simply that Legion means many, but that it carries this weight of like Roman military presence in that place too as a part of the unclean spirits within him. Jesus was entering into this profoundly multiracial, multinational setting in which he was doing ministry, and he was casting out these unclean spirits to see healing happen in the midst of that setting and that environment. And God was working in powerful ways in that setting and in that in the life of the garrison demoniac until he got to the point at which he was sitting with Jesus with a right mind and healed and clothed again. I grew up in uh, Colorado, just on the outskirts of Boulder, Colorado. And Colorado's a beautiful place if you've ever been there. It's a beautiful place. My world was not so multiracial or multinational where I grew up in Colorado. It was a very oddly segregated world when it came to race and ethnicity in my community. And it was strange because there was no laws that there should be segregation, you know, when I was growing up in the 1990s, but it just so happened that our schools were all profoundly segregated. So the high school I went to was 98% Caucasian or 98% white, and the other high school in my town was 70% Latino and Latina. My school was referred to as the wealthy school or the good school, and that school was referred to as the bad school, the school you didn't want to go to that was on the other side of the tracks. And as much as I am a loving person and I want to be a loving person, the ways in which people would describe the relationship between this school and that school were often used in very derogatory ways. That's the bad school, those are the bad people, and you can imagine other kind of words that people would use to describe them. And there was a way in which my participation in those social dynamics shaped me. They shaped me, informed me, and had a formative role in my life. My favorite sport growing up was basketball, 
And my very last basketball game as a high school student was against that high school in the playoffs. And we lost, and I still remember crying in the gym afterwards <laughs> at the loss of that basketball game. I'll never forget that moment of just pure tears uh, against our rivals. But I have to say, and what I mean by this idea is like, as much as I wanted to be a loving person, living in that social context, and that social environment, um, there were things that were formed in me that I needed to unform and unlearn. And a few years ago, Rafael Avendano invited me to come play basketball at Siena Youth Center about four years ago. And unbeknownst to him, I love basketball. And is, I was like, yes, I've been looking for a place to play basketball. <laughs> I have a deep hole and need in my life for this. So I went to play basketball. And the first time I got there, I was the only white person in the gym. And there was about 15 or 20 people in the gym. And I felt in me some like weird anxiety or a weird unclean spirit in me when I was in that gym that night. And I simply just tried my best to go, Jesus, what is happening in me right now? Like, I wanna be a loving person. I wanna be gracious and caring in the world in which I live in, but this is not a thing that I have formed in myself, but it's a part of my history and a part of my dynamic. And over the course of months and years, I feel like what was happening to me was that I was coming into a right mind. I was being clothed by Jesus with every layup, with every free throw, with every game we played together, and it felt like God was exercising some unclean spirits in me. And I regularly tell people that going to Siena now is the most joyful place in the world for me. And I mean it when I say that, because I feel like these unclean spirits have been removed from me. I've asked God to remove them from me, and in my participation with that community and the friends that I have there, they have been removed from me. Um, not entirely, obviously, because we live in a world, and yet, God has profoundly removed some unclean spirits in my life, and I can have a right mind and be clothed again. When Jesus meets us in our anxieties and our unclean spirits that are in us, he simply asks this question, what is your name? What is your name? And Jesus is more powerful than those unclean spirits and those anxieties and will meet us in them. And when he meets us in those anxieties, it's not simply so that he can enable us from them, but he wants us to feel that power and strength from him as well so that we can become a more faithful people, that we might be a people who in the face of a perishing say, no, I have faith, Jesus will take care of us. Jesus, come take care of us, I know who you are. Jesus, remove unclean spirits from me and from this world, I know who you are, I know the work that you do. Be with us, Lord, come be with us. At the very end of the, the Gerasene demoniac story, they're sitting together, Jesus and the Gerasene demoniac, and the demoniac says, can I become one of your disciples? Can I join you on your travels? And Jesus says, no, sorry, you can't come with me. But you have a better thing you get to go do. You get to go tell the whole world in the Decapolis about all the amazing things that the Lord has done in your life. Did you hear that? Remo Jesus was even removed from his life and he got to go do the work of sharing the gospel with people around the Decapolis and around all of the Gerasenes. Isn't that amazing? Friends, that's us when Jesus is in our life. Jesus will meet us, will give us a right mind, will clothe us, will be able to healthy relationship and faith, and then Jesus is gonna send us out to do ministry together, brothers and sisters in this world, to share the good news about all the great things the Lord has done in our midst. We join me in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the chance to worship together. And God, I just pray that we could be a people that bring our anxieties and our unclean spirits to you and that you might do your work in removing them from us and that we might find healing, we might find power and strength in you and we might be empowered to go out into the world to share good news about all the great things that you are doing, Lord. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you rise in body or spirit if you are able, and we will continue to worship.
This is my friend Rafael Avendano and our friend. He's the program director at Siena Youth Center. Yeah, let's welcome him. Thank you. Check, check. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here, church family. Um, it's always a blessing to be able to be in community and fellowship, learning, growing, um, and just doing life also with Brother Kurt and Pastor Mary. Um, just, you know, a lot of you have been just instrumental the past eight years into not just the, the Siena Youth Center, the St. Francis Center, but just my life. So I appreciate you for your prayers and your energy because uh, it really propels me to do the servant leadership daily. So God bless you. So uh, we're here just to tell you a little bit about the Miguel Mendez Lecture Series weekend. We've done this for the last two years in which we've invited a guest speaker to come that's nationally known to help us learn more about what one of our priorities was of engaging issues of injustice. And so this year, one of the ideas that we had that really, it came from Pam Daniels, I think, where she said, we've had these nationally recognized speakers speak about national issues, but we don't really engage missionally nationally. You know, we, we have a lot of global missions as a church and local missions. So we thought, well, what if we did something where we had a speaker come that could help us think more about our local mission partnerships and enrich that relationship that we have? And so the entire time we've been um, planning this weekend together with Siena and St. Francis. So I think Raphael may say something about that part of the Siena part on Saturday, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it and this invitation that you all have to come be a part of this weekend. Yeah, so a lot of people ask, you know, how can we, you know, learn more about Siena Youth Center and what, what's happening there. Um, and this is a great opportunity to actually come and learn, not just about Siena Youth Center St. Francis, but also what your church is already doing there and how you've already been activated by the Holy Spirit to walk in the presence. Uh, multiple church family members here are constantly weekly going and you know being a part of the mission already. Um, and I'm sure you all know, but it's also a good time to invite someone in your community, not just from church, but from outside of church, to be able to share our mission so that we could do it fruitfully and really do it more precisely, right? So this event is going to go into just the richness of the Latinx community and what we can do together to, to just fast the richness and be able to pour more fruit, right? Because um, it's important to learn too that, you know, that in our community, in our Latinx community, we have this cultural wealth, the linguistic, the cultural, the aspirational capitals that my wife always talks about. She's an amazing lecturer as well. And um, it's awesome to learn that from a professor and from someone who's touched by the Holy Spirit. For, I mean, it's awesome to read some of his works and what he's doing to activate God's presence in the kingdom. Yeah, so this year, our guest speaker, his name is Robert Chow Romero. He's a professor at UCLA in Chicano, Chicano Studies. And he's going to be here with us the whole weekend. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be really rich. On Friday night, we're going to have an informal dialogue downstairs in Fellowship Hall, potluck style. Uh, everyone is welcome and invited to be a part of that dialogue conversation. We'll have child care for that. And then on Saturday, we're going to have a big event that's going to be mixed together. I think this is the first time ever we've had a true event between Trinity and Siena and St. Francis all on that Saturday afternoon on February 22nd, 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. It's kid-friendly. Kids can come. There's going to be uh, dancers. There's going to be Tell dance of the dancing. Yeah, there's going to be <laughs> Son Jaracho, which is traditional guitar from Mexico. There's going to be uh, like flocorivo-based dance. Um, and there's also going to be, you know, a time for you to actually have a Q&A with the professor and Sister Christina um, and to also take tours. So it's really like informal-based learning. I call it non-traditional learning space. So... It's a great opportunity to, to bring someone. The hardest part is going to be able to find parking, but we're going to help you, right? <laughs> so that's the first part of being uncomfortable in the community because it's so densely populated. But once you get through that, you're, you, you don't want to miss this. I mean, Kurt, they yeah. got to come. Yeah, so <laughs> there's the invitation from Raphael. And honestly, uh, come if you've never been to Siena. This is, such a, this is going to be a great opportunity to come and learn about Siena and experience one of our local mission partnerships in a fresh way. It'll feel like a mission trip for three hours, really, and come and see what God is doing in the community and in all of our lives and our partnership. God is doing profound things with this partnership between our two institutions. And then Professor Romero will be preaching on Sunday morning. So it's a rich weekend. There's flyers we made. The ushers will pass them out after worship. On your way out, grab one. It's got the details on it and the outline of the weekend, so you can put it on your fridge or give them to your friends or family members. But last year, we had 100 people come to the lecture on Saturday. Let's get 100 people to come to Siena on Saturday, on February 22nd, and be a part of this event. 
So you all are invited to be a part of this. Food, arts and cultural just wealth, professors, Sister Christina speaking, Kurt, Pastor Mary, <laughs> and you get to deal with my energy. Come yeah. on. <laughs> you can't miss it. You can't miss it. And you got to right. see our kids too, right? Yeah, that's right. All right. All right. Thank you, church family. Thanks, Raphael. Thanks, brother. All right, I have two other short announcements. One is uh, the Garage Sale, another one of our mission partners, which is Amor Ministries, and the Youth Mexico Mission Trip starts this afternoon. So you can bring your donations today through Wednesday, and we really need all hands on deck. So if you have an hour free here or there this week, please, please come and sort and hang out and talk to people and have fun and, and just be a part of the Garage Sale this week and tell people about it. Spread the word. Spread the Facebook event. Um, it's going to be a fun week, and we're going to have a big sale next week on Friday and Saturday for the garage sale. So that's happening. And the last piece before the offering is that um, we did close our books for 2019 as a church, and we received some very generous gifts and donations in the last week, like right in the last days of 2019. And because we had less expenses, we were able to finish with about $50,000 over budget because of those things. So thanks be to God. And... And thank you to each and every one of you for the way that you have shown your generosity and your stewardship as a part of the life of the congregation. And now I'll invite the ushers to come down for this morning's offering. of the people this morning, I'd like to receive some requests from you all. Are there anything that this community would like to be praying for today? And I'll include them in my prayer. If you would like to make a request, just raise your hand and I'll point to you and I'll include it in my prayer. Government. Maybe another request or two. Yeah. Dave Cox. All right. The, the Granholm family, yeah. 
All right, join me in prayer. Let's, let's bow our heads and pray. Lord God, inspired by these stories from the Gospel of Mark, in which, frankly, some scary moments are happening, the potential of a boat being capsized and this person filled with unclean spirits coming to Jesus. So God, we have questions and we have anxiety, and Lord, we bring the anxiety and those questions to you now, God. And we ask that you would hear the prayers of our hearts, the prayers of our souls. God, for the words that I might say, that you would hear them, but more than that, that you would hear all of our hearts in this place and in this room together right now, God, that each of us may have some anxieties. And Lord, I ask that you would hear them. God, we continue to pray for the Granholm family. We especially lift up to you in prayer, Shirley, for 65 years of marriage between the two of them. What a gift, God. But certainly now it's going to be challenging, perhaps, to live without someone you've been married to for 65 years. So, Lord, we pray blessings upon Shirley. We ask that you would lift her up now in this time. God, that this community could support her and be with her and that you would take care of her, God, and that her family would continue to love her and be gracious unto her. And may we also be gracious unto her as well. God, we pray for children and families in our community on this Family Sunday, that there's a lot of anxiety and a lot of things to do in our lives as well. And so, God, I pray that you would help us slow down just a little bit too, that we might make space in our lives or at the dinner tables or in the evenings to just consider where you're at work and maybe allow you a space to ask us some questions about what's going on in our lives and that we could bring you our despair, we could bring you our anxiety and feel stronger and more faithful in the world in which we live. God, we lift up to you the government. We pray for the United States, God. There's a whole bunch of turmoil as it seems when you look at the news and things happening and that can feel very unstable in our lives as we look at that information, as we receive the news. So Lord, it's very confusing times. And I pray God that you who are Lord and King over all would be able to provide some sort of stability in the midst of all of these things. God, you are King and King, you are Lord of Lords, you are the one who reigns seated at right hand of God the Father. And so we remember that, that you are Lord of heaven and earth. And you are truly Lord over heaven and earth, even right now in the midst of what feels like profoundly unstable times into the life of this government. We pray for the government, God, and for all the people who lead it, that you would infuse them with a right mind, a right spirit, that they would be able to do this wisely. We pray for Dave Cox, for whatever's going on in his life, God. May you be with him. Gracious God, we give you thanks for a partnership with Siena and St. Francis, and we continue to pray blessings upon their ministries, and that we may learn from their motto of compassion, not judgment. May we be a people who are compassionate in this world as we share and tell the good news about Jesus Christ with those around us. And Lord, I pray for the garage sale this week. I pray that you would infuse that time with amazing conversations and rich relationships this week that as people look at earrings, that people look at clothing items as they sort things, God, that your spirit would be present in the midst of all of it and that you would be there. Lord, we give you thanks for all of these things. And God, we give you thanks for the way you transform our lives as you get the unclean spirits out of us and we find ourselves in a right mind and a right relationship with you. Send us out into the world, God, to be a people who proclaim good news and share about all the ways that you are at work, Lord. May we be like the demoniac in that way and tell the Decapolis, tell San Carlos the good news. Be with us, Lord. We pray this all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you are able, you rise in body or spirit for our concluding song this morning.
says, peace, be still. When there are unclear spirits within, Jesus says, what is your name? And he removes them from us. So may you go now with the peace of God, the love of the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of Jesus Christ now and forevermore. Amen.